Circle box on the floor didn't have power. There you go. And now the person who solved the problem. My well, AOP is good for something. <laughs> So, you know, I've been I've been out of academia now for a few years, and uh, never really lost touch with it. I've always wanted to go back. Um, so my talk is kind of different. It's sort of more rooted in the, in the commercial applications of of some of the earlier work that I've done in the past. Can you speak up a little bit? Okay, sure. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> haven't spoken in this room for quite a while now. Uh, before I actually jump into you know what what I'm doing these days and what's going on with aspect oriented programming and everything, uh, I'll just give you a little bit of history. I came here in 1991. I came to IU. I came from India, uh, and at that time, I was in love with Miranda. Now, you guys are probably wondering what that has to do with any of this. Uh, I'm speaking of the programming language Miranda. <laughs> Anyone hear of it? <laughs> Anyone use it? Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> okay. What's that? It's trademark. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, anyway, it didn't last very long. I started five eleven, uh, but she was hot. Uh, uh, the the one I I ended up marrying was Scheme, of course, and I learned it first in dance class. And uh, what we learned was those three things over there: eval, CPS. And CPT is probably something you might have guessed, but what it stands for here is correctness preserving transformations. Key influences, uh, which sort of, hmm, you know, this is cool. I could, I could work with this. And uh, so I think at the end of that semester, I went to Dan and said, hey, I, you know, I'd like to work with you for a PhD or something. He said, no, no, you don't know yet. You need to take 611. And <laughs> <laughs> So, so I ended up taking 611, and that one really nailed it. You know, the first few classes we did extend syntax, reflection, mops, there were a ton of other things that, you know, that we learned were very, very interesting. And then he made me do a minor in logic. You know, I was thinking, you know, I'm going to do some cool little minor in music or something like that. And he said, no, you've got to do a minor in logic. And it's one of the most important things I've ever done in my life. Actually understanding mathematical logic was, it was really great. And you know, all through this time, and it was Dan's style to give you little things to do, right? Here's a little problem, go solve it. You know, here's this little thing that I'm thinking of and what's going on. And you know, yes, you did all of these things. They were cool and fun. And he never really gave you the big picture. And you know, those of, <laughs> those of you who are a student, you, you'd know this is what happens. But what he was really teaching me, and what, what I really learned and I took away more than anything else, you know, uh, was that you need to build the abstractions that you really need to solve your problem correctly, elegantly, efficiently. All the illities that, you know, Bob Fillman talked about yesterday. <laughs> and that is a lesson that I took away from, from uh, my whole experience at IU. And so I found myself at at Xerox Palo Alto Research Center working on aspect-oriented programming. Let me, let me give you a little bit of a history of, of aspect-oriented programming. And you know, what I have here is some of the key points here. And I'm sure there's lots of other influences on AOP that you know, people in this room have contributed to. So apologies if you know, we don't see your contributions up here. But this is sort of the seminal AOP idea the Parnas paper on decomposing systems, uh, where the idea of you know, taking concerns and separating them out into modules was first sort of proposed. 
He never actually used the term separation of concerns. That was actually used by Dijkstra in 1976. <coughs> but that was the right idea. When you're programming, you're building complex systems, you want to break, take your concerns, you want to break them apart, you want to treat them separately so that the others don't have to worry about it. In 1982, Brian Smith, who used to be faculty here, is he still here? No. Okay. Okay. So he introduced uh, uh, reflection in programming languages, which was, even, even today when I read it, it's just, it just blows me away. <laughs> this is such a unique idea. And that actually you know, was introduced to me by Dan, of course, uh, in, in various little in reflective interpreters that we wrote over all the years that I was here. But that work really led into meta-object protocols and open implementations. And uh, which is what I started working on at, uh, at Xerox Park, the, the, the mini open compiler and things like that. And it was in 1994 that the ideas about aspect-oriented programming really started to come together. And we wrote the first comprehensive paper on it in 1997. There's two little boxes, there's two little things there that are very important. In 1997, Crystal Lodge came up with a language called D, which was the first instance of aspect-oriented programming for a complex domain like distributed computing systems. And the first instance of how powerful this thing could be. Uh, in 1997, you know, I went off and started online anywhere, and this was really the first commercial application of ideas around aspect-oriented programming. And you know, ended up being very successful, and I'll talk about it in a little bit. And in 2001, the team, you know, Eric, Eric's looking back. Eric and others, they actually went off and built a whole Java-oriented tool set around uh, aspect-oriented programming called Aspect J. And in 2004, uh, you know, again, JBoss started to come out with aspect-oriented programming features, and IBM adopted aspect-oriented programming. So what started off as you know, uh, an early idea about 10 years ago is now starting to come out in the real world. A little word over there, blue vector, two little words over there, blue vector, which is what I'm doing right now. This is uh, a company that does sensor based distributed computing. And what I'll show you through this talk is you know, we really used ideas from Dan and other, you know, and other people to actually uh, create a very, very exciting sort of new application for aspect oriented programming. Throughout this talk, you know, you're going to see a lot of what I think AOP is about. You know. <laughs> lots of differences, but this is going to be my view of it. Uh, so my view of the aspect-oriented programming, and you saw, you know, Bob talk about AOP yesterday as sort of, you know, going through the next generation of what, what programming is all about. But this is how I really look at it, you know. These are three things that, three circles that people have looked at separately, you know, over, over the ages. Separation of concerns, of course, I, you know, I just talked about that. Domain-specific languages have been around for a while. Generalized composition. This is sort of the new thing that, that AOP really brought into bear. Uh, uh, sort of didn't bring to bear, but really made things more explicit about composition. And I'll just explain that in a little bit. Suppression of concerns is a very simple idea. You know, it doesn't need too much explanation. Take your concerns, break them up into separate modules. The problem was that traditionally, the only modules that were available to you were functional blocks or objects or ADTs or things like that, which you know, had, had a certain contiguity to them. AOP's observation was that there are some concerns that you can't really put into a module. They don't fit into a functional block. They don't fit into an ADT or something like that. So what they said was it's far more important that you keep your concerns separate rather than try to map it to a module that doesn't really work for you. Domain-specific languages are equally important in AOP because there are specific semantic concepts <coughs> that you need to address different concerns. If you want to talk, talk about your caching strategy, in your program, you better know what a cache is. You know, you, 
if you're talking about persistence, you better know that there is a database at the back end, right? And that there are semantic concepts there that are, that are important to you when you're uh, addressing those concerns. <clears throat> One of the key things is that, you know, traditionally programming languages, and we saw an example of this in, you know, Olin's talk yesterday, <laughs> you know, everybody tries to map what their idea of the abstraction is onto what's available to them, right? So, so and why tail recursive calls really fail for writing loops, right? And, and, the, and the main reason for doing that really, where people just say, okay, what's available to me? Let me map everything to it, right? Because my language doesn't support it. Right? The AOP view of things is that if your language doesn't support it, well, invent it and put it in there. And we've seen a number of examples of this in the talks yesterday and today as well. So it's far more important you know, from the AOP perspective that you express your concern correctly using the semantic concepts that you need in order to, um, to express that concern. <clears throat> now this is a tricky one. Composition, right? Composition is very near and dear to us. You know, we, we really love composition. We love the compose function. And the traditional sort of a view of composition is that, or rather I should say decomposition, is decomposition by information hiding. You know, you group everything that is supposed to be related and you put, you know, a, a function calling or an event exchange protocol around that little box. And it's basically this little notation here that, that drives all of that, right? And then when you put things together, your composition is very simple, right? It's, it's well defined, it's well preserved. What AOP's observation was that not everything aligns along these lines of composition. If you really want to talk about your caching strategy or your persistence, you need to talk, if you want to compose a module that says cache, the cache works across F and across G. You can't really say that it's independent of F and G. So AOP's observation was that it's more important that the decomposition at the highest level align with your concerns, not with what's available to you, which means you need to invent the composition mechanisms that you need. And over the years, right, people have invented a number of what I call composition mechanisms, reflective programming. The whole idea that you define a meta class that affects the semantics of your language is really a way for you to reach in, into F and into G and do some, something over there. Monads is a classic example. We saw a great presentation by Mitch yesterday uh, about you know how it sort of reached into the streams and reached into the continuations and defined stuff over there. And Mitch also has a paper on AOP, I believe, from using Monads. Uh, schemeless macros, uh, the stuff that Olin talked about yesterday and the stuff that Lynn, Lynn talked about yesterday about creating these abstractions using macros, putting them in the language. These are ways of creating alternative forms of composition of modules, right? And the, and the most general form of all of this is really the AOP Weaver. The Weaver in, in an aspect-oriented programming system is really giving you a way of generalizing your composition of modules. Okay. So unlike traditional definitions of AOP, which, which focus very much on the cross-cutting of concerns and things like that, I sort of come back to the roots of what AOP is really about. You know, it's a style of system design that is based on separation of concerns, with each concern being expressed precisely in those terms as it needs to be. And each of those concerns thereby is an aspect, really, and hence, hence, the, hence the term. So if I were to, you know, put AOP in Dan style, and, and I think this here is a, is a PhD thesis, really, is that you have n concerns expressed in n different languages. And you're writing n different interpreters for it, but they're all in the same eval expert. And they're all interacting with each other. So when you eval x0, you might need to eval all the other x as well. Right. And that's really the essence of what, what AOP is all about. My experience with AOP, you know, 
I've been working on it now for, for over 10 years. Did a number of lab implementations, image processing, numerical methods, signal processing. And I've done, I've done two commercially deployed system designs. The first one was only loosely based on IOP because I didn't really understand it as well. Uh, and what this was, was it was a system for generating mobile content uh, for, you know, for content providers like Yahoo and other people like that. In fact, the system did end up being installed at Yahoo and was used daily by you know, millions of users. And we were able to do this. What was really great about this was that we were able to do a whole lot of stuff with very little. And the power of the abstractions, the power of, of AOP was really helping us you know, propel that forward. And then Schindler was sitting in, in the back over there was one of the, one of the key contributors to this. The second commercial implementation that I've done with AOP is uh, really with Blue Vector Systems. And what, what Blue Vector Systems does is creates a networking infrastructure for sensor-based distributed computing. Um, we'll talk a little more about that in a minute. And, and the way we're able to, to leverage AOP is that with seven people, we've now actually created a system that can really scale to global proportions just by simply replicating very easy building blocks. Okay. So a little bit about Blue Vector. In the world of sensor-based computing, what's happening right now uh, is that a number of companies and other institutions are looking to monitor their physical assets by deploying sensors over geographically dispersed areas. And what they really need is sort of smarts at the end of those sensors, around those sensors, that are actually processing the sensor data and generating business process events and things like that. And what they need is once they start to actually build these implementations, they go out there, they put a PC there, and you know, they do all kinds of work around the PC. But when they start looking at the scale at which they're going to deploy this, which is typically you know, hundreds of thousands of these endpoints, uh, they need a system that can be easily built out and managed. And that's what Blue Vector does. We've done that by deploying basically networking appliance type architectures. And we've scaled that up. Uh, we can scale that up to whatever dimensions are, that are needed. The key thing that, that is needed in this type of a problem is that the intelligence that is spread out across a sensor network is not uniform. You know, if you have a sensor in this part of the room, it might need to do a different type of local intelligence processing than sensors that might be at the door, for example. So as you build out your implementation, you, know, you have hundreds of thousands of these compute elements that are spread out across the world each of them doing slightly different things than the other. So you need a distributed computing system that can actually manage from a, from a deployment perspective, from a maintenance perspective, how you can actually uh, reconfigure those endpoints. And that's really where we've used aspect-oriented programming. And what we do really is that when we ship our little appliances that you know, distribute the intelligence, uh, they don't have anything in them. They just have a bootloader. What happens is when, when you boot up, uh, when you boot up that device, it connects to a central server and downloads a code image that is designed specifically for that particular uh, appliance or that particular compute element. And all of those code images are generated by an automated weaver. And the reason is we, the reason that we can make all of this very easy for an end user to manage is that we've taken out where we've separated the concerns of partitioning and functionality in the system. Now, when you design distributed systems, and those of you who've done this, the hardest thing about distributed programming is trying to map your, what, what you want to do with your program onto a given network. And what AOP allows you to do is really separate these two things out. So that from, from an end user perspective, all of these things are mostly hidden from you partitioning, you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about which specific computer I'm updating. All I need to know is this part of the room needs to be behaving this way, that part of the room needs to be behaving that way, so you can focus on the functionality of it. So it becomes a very easy system to manage and maintain. And that's really what, what Blue Vector System does. And when we set out to design this system, what we did was, this was literally what we did. 
walked up to a whiteboard. And we wrote down those concerns that are up there. Network hierarchy, device kit. These are all the concerns that we had in our system. We defined a language, you know, first we wrote it in English, we defined, okay. We defined what it's supposed to do. We, we just wrote it up. And, and then we went in and did an abstract design of each of those specifications. We wrote a weaver for it. Now we have a, you know, a system that is totally and completely scalable. It's very easy to design, very easy to, to implement, of course, the caveat there. Uh, I know how to write weavers, but, but from, uh, from an end user perspective, very easy to use. Okay. The lessons that I've learned over all, this, all the designs that I've done over the last few years, you know, it's not about aspect-oriented programming, it's about aspect-oriented aspect design. You have to change the way you think before you can actually implement AOP system. <coughs> it is very, very hard to write a generalized weaver. You, you can never do it. And a successful aspect-oriented design will always have handcrafted weavers because, again, it's rooted in the domain, it's rooted in the problem that you're trying to solve. And you'd better have done 511 and 531, <laughs> right? Because you can't do it otherwise. Uh, even today, you know, I am the only person who can actually write the weaver in our company. You know, it, it would be very hard for me to go find a replacement for myself to take over the weaver. Which leads me to this last point, which is in aspect-oriented systems, the aspect-oriented architects are going to be very, very specialized. And they're going to be people who are in this room, who are like the people in this room. <laughs> A little caveat about uh, domain-specific languages. You know, it, when I tell my engineers, OK, we're making a new language for, you know, uh, for doing this particular aspect, you know, they panic for a second whole new syntax and my engineers are not used to it but customers are <laughs> they, they just back it's a whole new language you know where we to them language is syntax right so I tell them oh no no don't worry it's in it's in an XML format oh then it's fine <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> you know it's so I call it the X, S expressions for the new millennium uh, except they're far more complicated uh, so what I've learned actually is to Use XML as, as the format, you know, not, not, not as expressions. Uh, and I hate that. But <laughs> the other thing that I've learned is you've got to dumb it down. You know, we had this little argument uh, you know, about my chief software architect. And I had this very nice constraint-based language for one of the aspects. Uh, and it was, you know, beautiful first-order logic that exists for all and everything. He says, no one's going to use this. I said, what do you mean? It's first order logic. It's sip. No one's going to use it. And he's absolutely right. None of our customers, none of our engineers, other than myself and, and maybe this guy, uh, could ever use it. So we actually had to dumb it down to a level where you know, now it's just four little declarative things that are you know, very easy to state and very easy to understand. They don't cover you know, everything we could have done with the constraint language. But it's enough to get by. So, you know, as aspect-oriented programming, you know, really starts to get out in the real world, we have to teach people how to think differently. And you know, we do a good job in this room, but you know, I, I need to evangelize this more because I can't hire the people that I need. <laughs> uh, what I think we really—it's—it's it's all about what we learned here at IU. What I learned here at IU programming language design, how to be very, very careful about the abstractions that you build, build them right, and have all the techniques in your, in your back pocket to actually implement them, right? Abstract interpretation, monadic semantics, and heinle milner type systems are three techniques that you know, I've used over and over again, so really very, very important. And that's it. They like the idea. 
but the design of that language should be as simple as possible. Uh, the, to me, uh, the design of the language, I wanted to get complete functionality with minimum uh, expression, uh, minimum, I should say, with most expressibility. So that's why I wanted to use first order logic, which is you know very easy to sort of declaratively state and all of that. But nobody understands how to specify constraints in that language. It's, it's a sad state of the world, but that's what it is. I really liked your slide with uh, an expression Two questions. First one is, do we have an idea, any idea how big N is going to get? And the second one is, why do you need so many continuations? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, yeah, how big N gets is typically based on the domain you're working with, but it's not very big. The, the diagram that I showed you is the biggest, is the most. And also, it's not necessary that the composition that's used for some of those aspects has to be unique and cross-cutting. I mean, it, it could well be possible that some of those aspects work very well under the you know, standard composition. This is why I call it generalized composition. It's not, we're not replacing the notion of existing compositions. So you know, it really depends on the design. But it won't be more than a handful. It will be very hard to handle more than a handful, unless some guy decides to machine generate different aspects. On which but what about the second question? Uh, that was to keep it as general as possible, right? Uh, so that all your aspects could be, you know, fully scheme-like languages. Paul Graham has a similar success story, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. except that he didn't dumb it down for his company. He only hired people from programming lists. You know. So from your last, from your next to last slide, I take it that you have to dumb it down even for your own engineers. Yes. Why do you get better ones? <laughs> uh, various reasons, ease of finding them, trying to, you know. The first company, you know, I was very lucky I hired. You know, my first engineer I ever hired was actually Schindler. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I haven't had as much luck the second time. Well, they do have clothing now. And you're saying that you're the only person in your company who can do the SPP. But do you have enough, as much of an understanding of how to do an SPP that you can explain it in the fashion that you wrote that uh, the slide that Dan was talking about to say a 511 class? Could you explain it? No, I don't. And in fact, uh, it's not from uh, lack of trying. That's why I said it's actually worth the PhD thesis. Uh, it is, you have to pick the right, you know, set of, first you've got to pick the right example problem and then work off of that. And you know, the problems that I had were always too complicated and <laughs> very hard to work around. Uh, but, but there is, uh, but I think that level of understanding of AOP to, to take what what people understand of AOP and convert it to a, a 511 style interpreter, I think would be a huge, huge step in promoting uh, the understanding of AOP. So do you have a domain specific language or AOP language for writing your paper yet? I write it in Scheme. Sure, please. Yeah. <laughs> yep. All right, that's a good note to end. <laughs> Thanks.